presently. We now turn to the Judicature Modernisation Bill. The question is that... Hey, point of order, Jamie Lee Ross. Here I seek leave for the Judicature Modernisation Bill to be debated as one question with all votes taken separately at the end. Right. Is there any objection to that process? There appears to be none. So the question is that parts 1 to 6, schedules 1 to 11 and clauses 1 and 2 stand part. Jacinda Ardern. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, you'll see just um, as a visual aid that the Judicature Modernisation Bill is a, a weighty um, bill. Um, uh, a doorstop, as my colleague has described, but despite, um, despite the fact that it is so um, weighty, there does seem to be um, some uh, universal support, near universal support at least, for what this uh, weighty uh, document is attempting to do. And so that theme will probably come through in the debate um, today. Uh, the Judicature Act, um, as it stands, uh, is over 100 years old. There is universal agreement that it absolutely needed to be updated, and so I do thank the Ministry of Justice and the Minister for the work that's been done in that regard. It has taken some time. The Law Commission um, did produce recommendations to consolidate this document, uh, both the um, Courts Act with the Supreme Court Act, um, some time uh, ago. So, uh, as I say, it is timely that we finally come to the point of reaching committee stages um, here today. I want to run through some of the substantive changes that this bill um, also introduced. Even though we'll be debating as one part, I will thematically go through and begin with um, some of the part one changes. And I think it's fair to... Um, uh, to categorise the part one changes as being focused on simplification, on streamlining and on transparency. There's a couple of opportunities that are missed here and I will touch on them briefly as well. So part one repeals the Supreme Court Act 2003 and the Judicature Act 1908, creates the new Senior Courts Bill, uh, which will put all of the senior courts, High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court under one um, system. And in doing so, streamlines the appointment of non-permanent judges, establishes a judicial panel for hearing certain types of commercial cases, repeals um, the commercial list, which has set out um, case management approaches, gives more power to restrict vexatious civil litigants, an area where we're seeing more self-representation and probably timely. Uh, originally, it also required the publishing of, uh, and part of this um, provision remains, provide uh, publishing of information relating to reserved judgments, recusal from cases, suitability of judges holding employment or other offices. And I note um, a useful SOP from the Greens on declarations around um, pecuniary interests in this regard. Um, but also talks about um, uh, requiring final written judges, judgments to be published unless a good reason exists not to do that. We have had an SOP from the minister in um, that area, and I just want to touch on that SOP very, very quickly. Um, SOP 107 by the Minister makes by and large a few changes which we're generally supportive of, particularly around things like commencement dates, um, superannuation subsidies for acting judges and the like, but one of the things it does is reverse the requirement for mandatory publication of decisions online. Now. We're slightly disappointed that that's happened. We do think that there needs to be a longer term plan to allow that to happen. Um, and so we will seek, uh, seek uh, down the track from officials, what are we doing to make sure we have greater transparency? If you want to make a judicial um, complaint, for instance, and I have had people come to me and say they want to do that, but the lack of transcribed um, uh, rulings, judgments from uh, uh, hearings makes that difficult. And so that, I think, ultimately would be a good place for us to head. I want to come, though, to actually some of our SOPs that cover this part, um, because we have a couple of really substantive SOPs that, on the face of it, may seem simple, uh, but capture constant matters of constitutional importance and weight, and which I'll be seeking the House's um, support for. In fact, one of the SOPs that I want to speak to um, is SOP, uh, my, in my name, SOP number 62, was not originally raised by me, but actually members of um, uh, the judiciary in particular. I want to refer um, to um, uh, Judge McGrath's uh, retirement speech, 
which um, has been referenced in the media. The fact that a retirement speech is, is obviously the chance to reflect on a, a lengthy career as a member of the judiciary and of our legal fraternity, and the fact that this retiring judge used that special opportunity to reflect what was happening here in Parliament in this particular provision, to me, speaks to the weight of this issue. So I want to, I want to read from that retirement speech, just for a moment, if the House would uh, let me, because it relates directly to part one. He says, just bearing in mind, I hope you forgive me if I detour for a few minutes to raise a matter of constitutional kind that causes me some concern, Mr Chair. Our constitution is an informal one. It is not set out in any single document. It has been described as the product of a complex mass of forces of a political, legislative, um, prerogative and judicial in nature. As a result, the New Zealand Constitution is found in some rules that have been enacted by Parliament, some rules of common law uh, by the courts, and a number of conventions which are appropriately described as established understandings. Most New Zealanders are happy with these arrangements, and so am I. I do not favour replacement with a formal constitution. He goes on, but I do believe that there are gaps in our constitutional arrangements. We also need to ensure that we do not, as a society, inadvertently create new gaps in our constitution. The Constitution Act 1986 provides that Parliament continues to have full powers to make full law. Now, that net recognises with clarity that Parliament is the supreme law-making power of the nation. There is no equivalent provision in that Act stating, that act, uh, stating the role of the judicial branch nor indeed the underlying concept of the judicial function, which is to uphold the rule of law. That gap was filled to some extent when this court, the Supreme Court of New Zealand, was established in 2003. The legislation stipulated that nothing in the Act affects New Zealand's continuing commitment to the rule of law and the sovereignty of Parliament. Commitment to the rule of law is a simple but important constitutional concept. It means our nation's commitment to the principle that all persons and all bodies, whether public or private, must comply with the law and are entitled to exercise all right that it gives them, upholding this principle is central role of the courts. That provision, as set out in the Supreme Court Act 2003, in this act of consolidation to create the Judicature Modernisation Bill, is lost. That rule of law provision once this bill is enacted, voted for in this House, will no longer exist. Now, I want to acknowledge at this point that I've, in select committee, posed this question both to the Attorney General and to the Minister of Justice and been met with sympathy to this issue. They acknowledge that it is an important provision. The question and debate has come down, where, does it best, where is it best placed? Now, I do not dispute the argument that the Constitution Act would be the appropriate place for the rule of law provision. I don't dispute that. I think I would probably agree with um, both ministers on that point. The issue, however, is that our opportunity here at this point in time is to only amend the Judicature Modernisation Bill. We did seek advice from the Clerk of the House on whether or not it would be possible to make a subsequent amendment to the Constitution Act and was told it was out of scope. So herein lies our one opportunity. Now, if in the future the government were to say we would like to place it separately in the Constitution Act, I would have no trouble supporting that. But as a holding pattern, I would like to see it, I would absolutely seek the House's support to have it in the meantime sit where it has sat for over 10 years now and in the Judicature Modernisation yeah. Act as it consolidates the Supreme Court Act of 2003. And it's an incredibly important provision. I know that it may not have registered um, with many New Zealanders, and I can see good cause for why. I can see good cause for why. But it has, for instance, been the subject of debate amongst the legal fraternity. We cannot look lightly on our constitutional provisions simply because members of the public may not have engaged directly with them. It is our job to ensure that those provisions are robust and where they should be and upheld. Uh, and that's why I see it as our job today uh, in this House to support such provisions. Uh, and uh, SOP, our SOP number 62 is not the only SOP that speaks to that issue. Uh, uh, I would say that also entrenching some of the conventions around consultation for the appointment of Māori Land Court judges uh, under Lewis's Wall's name uh, fits in that space as well, uh, as does um, uh, my clause six, uh, SOP 63, which amends clause three of the bill, which enables important legal matters, including legal matters relating to the Treaty of Waitangi, to be resolved with an understanding of New Zealand's history, conditions and traditions. Again, another provision from the Supreme Court Act 
2003, which has been lost in the consolidation of the Judicature Modernisation Bill, all incredibly important. I do just want to reflect briefly that um, Dr Richard uh, Corns, who is a senior lecturer um, at Essex University and a visiting fellow at Otago Centre for Legal Issues, uh, has also written um, on the need for us to retain this rule of law provision. I know that he has worked hard to raise the profile of this issue with members of this House as well. I thank him for that, um, that work. Um, but he, uh, he referred Chairman, to... Chairman, Chairman, Mr Chairman. The Honourable David Parker.